Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed show with your spicy hosts, Tara and Sylvie. We show up every episode to expose, uncover, and share what we know about SEX. This isn't what you'll find in a typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and we're doing what we can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from the cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you are looking for more after the show, we invite you to get social. Our Instagram is the.sexed.show, and we would love for you to give us a follow or slide into our DMs. Most people have them. Erotic, sexy, hot fantasies that get our juices flowing, bodies aroused, and genitals throbbing. But what happens when these fantasies and desires are considered a little taboo or really taboo? Do you keep them a secret, never to be discussed, or maybe even acted out? On today's show, we're going to center on the taboo, on fantasies, desires, and why be naughty can feel so damn sexy. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous people of the Treaty 7 region and Métis Region 3. And I think we're going on to our somatic inquiry, which Sylvie so kindly volunteered to do. This one's really special and juicy. Yes, this is a really special somatic inquiry for us today because it is written by one of our mentors, Caffin Jesse. And Caffin is really special to us because they are also one of the founders of the somatic sex education school that we attend. And Caffin wrote this fantasy doorways meditation that we're about to do because fantasies are not merely mental constructs, right? We respond to fantasies viscerally. We can enjoy arousal and orgasm in our dreams. And this is why sometimes they reside a little bit in that realm of the unconscious. So what we're going to do with this somatic inquiry and offering is go a little bit deeper, maybe touch touch on your unconscious, just a a tiny little bit. We're not going right down deep into hypnosis, but we're sort of touching that surface. So with that, we'll start. Start by breathing slowly and deeply as you allow all parts of your body to relax. And imagine you're walking down a hill on a beautiful path, a path that's leading you to a place where you feel very safe. Remember or imagine the ground you're walking on. Feel the temperature of the air, the light breeze caressing your face. Remember or imagine the quality of the light as you go down the hill. Feel your body brushing against the bushes and feel your feet on the ground. Feel the tension in your face, your neck and shoulders, letting go. Notice your breath deepen and slow. Notice your mind letting go and relaxing. Feel a half smile arising in your relaxed mind and spreading that smile through your body with each breath. Breathe a relaxed smile into your eyes, your nose, your lips, your ears, your throat. Smile into your heart, your belly, and your genitals. Breathe a relaxed half smile into your skin. Imagine now that you come upon a spiral staircase going down, down, down into the ground. The staircase is made of beautiful stonework. It's handcrafted. You feel very safe as you grasp the handrail and begin walking down towards the glowing light below. Walk down the staircase and down and down until you come to a bright and beautiful hallway with doors on either side. Smile to yourself as you hear the sounds of pleasure coming from behind each door. 
walk down the hall, looking at the doors until you find the doorway that is just for you. Take a deep breath, master your courage and open the door to find whatever scene is unfolding there. Notice the people or beings or objects, whatever is in there for you. Notice the environment, the colors, the textures, and the smells. Notice your own body trembling with anticipation. And now, just let that fantasy scene unfold in whatever way is right for you right now. You can pause this recording if you want to give yourself a little bit more time, or you could also just momentarily enjoy this snippet of fantasy. And when you're ready and it's time to say goodbye to this fantasy, you can say goodbye and go on out the door, back into the hallway, knowing that you will remember all you have experienced. Find your way back to the stairway again and begin climbing. As you climb back into the upper world, I will count from nine to one, bringing everything you need from your journey back. Nine, eight, seven, feeling the edges of the spiral staircase as you climb back into the everyday world. Six, five, four, beginning to feel your body now in the present moment, wiggling your fingers and toes, letting your eyes open gradually, bringing everything you need to remember from your journey. Three, two, one, welcome back to the present moment. You might want to take a little time to wiggle your toes and your fingers and get back into the present space. But that was your fantasies doorway meditation and you can come back and listen to that any time. How was that for you, Tara? <laughs> I think I'm still adjusting to real life. <laughs> But I most definitely needed that because this last week, I haven't even had much opportunity to really focus on my erotic self. And it was interesting because, you know, usually I have some really extreme taboo fantasies when I do this exercise. And this time it was like really sensual and like just being held by people, kind of like a cuddle party, a cuddle puddle with a whole bunch of people in like a nice, beautiful room with silk blankets. And yeah, I guess it kind of changes depending on what you need in the moment too. It's not always going to be the same fantasy that you see, which is interesting to me. Yeah. I love that. Do you find that your fantasies tend to have the same themes though? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean... I don't know, like sort of, I guess, but this one wasn't really along this, the themes that I typically have. There's always like a sense of sensuality because I'm, I like nice, sexy things like beautiful smells like lemongrass and soft sheets and a breeze coming through a, a warmer room kind of thing. Like I like being really comfortable. But yeah. other than that, like, some of them are really, really raunchy. And some of them are really, really soft and feminine energy. And but usually there's like, yeah, I don't know. They change from time to time. It's interesting because when when I learned about fantasy, when I was when I was studying somatic sex education before I became um, before we came to the sex bod school, we learned about something called core desires that underlie fantasies. So core desires is actually or core erotic themes is something that Jack Morin talks about in The Erotic Mind. And it's basically the idea that 
everyone has a blueprint of a thing that really turns them on and that that blueprint got formed in childhood. And it's a feeling that we want to have during sex and that comes up in fantasy. But even though that feeling is always present, we can build different fantasies on top of it. So for example, if you use the analogy of writing a movie, let's say you write movies for a living and the producer of a studio comes to you and says, I want you to write a movie about bravery, right? So bravery in this case would be the theme. Now you could write any number of scripts based on bravery, right? Like it could look like saving private Ryan, or it could look like, you know, a dog and a cat, like, on a raft, you know, defying all odds, rescue, whatever. So both movies, obviously very different, both both based on the same theme of bravery. And so what Jack Morin says is that everyone has these themes that underpin all of their fantasies. And usually there's just one or two of these themes and that we then build out all of our fantasies around those themes. Yeah, that makes sense. Sounds a lot like Jaya's erotic blueprints as well. Yeah. I mean, Jaya also based a lot of her work off of Jack Morin's erotic mind. So that's like, it's such a pivotal book. And I I highly recommend it to anyone who is really interested in digging into fantasy and into why we fantasize about things that sometimes we don't even like. And what is the point of fantasies? Like, what is a fantasy? Why do we even have them? What's your answer to that, Tara? Like, what is a fantasy to you? Oh, a fantasy to me, like what it means to me would probably be some longing or desire, something that, I mean, okay, first of all, fantasies don't always mean that I want them to come true. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's what they are. They're just a fantasy and they live in my mind as something that I find really, really hot or sexy and that's kind of where they're going to stay. And sometimes it is like a a longing or a desire or something that I want to take place. Yeah. So just to get into the sort of more clinical definition of what is a fantasy. uh, So if we look at what a fantasy is, according to the literature, a sexual fantasy or an erotic fantasy is a mental image or pattern of thoughts that stirs your loins while you're awake. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) I don't know where I took that definition from, but I really liked the usage of the word loins. Um, It sparks your sexuality and can create or enhance sexual arousal. Mm -hmm. So what it's saying is it's it's basically any mental picture that comes to your mind while you're awake that ultimately turns you on and gets you feeling all hot and bothered and maybe even gets that blood flowing and pumping to your genitals. And it can be created by pure imagination, or it can be a memory, or it can be a combination of all of those things. Right. Yeah. And it can sometimes materialize out of thin air. And sometimes it can't materialize out of thin air. And we need to work a little harder for that, either by reading erotica or watching porn or going to a sexy show or, you know, a sex party. And sometimes that's what's needed in order to kickstart our imaginations. And sometimes we don't need anything to kickstart our imagination. What do you typically find, Tara? What works best for you to get you into that fantasy state of mind? Well, most of the fantasies that I go, my go-to fantasies, if you will, uh, they are typically created in my mind. They're not a memory they're nothing I've seen in any sort of porn or erotica or anything I've read. They just, it's a few things that I find really hot and I kind of like piece them together. And that's what I will use usually when I'm masturbating. Yeah. Are they people you know? Are they like, do you, do you fantasize about people you know in them or are they, or people you've seen before or are they like complete, like, you know, those AI generators that generate human faces. Are they like imagined human people who you've never met before? Yeah. I've never met before. It's not usually faces that I recognize. Cool. Just bodies. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Bodies with genitals. Nice. 
(laughs) And sometimes like, even for myself, if I'm like, I fantasize like what I want my body to look like. So like more porn starry, if that makes sense. Like my body isn't my body sometimes in a fantasy either. That's cool. I know that actually a lot of people, Justin LaMilla actually has a really great book on fancy called Tell Me What You Want. And I think he talks about seven different types of fantasy that are, that are very pervasive, um, that almost everyone has had at some point. And, it, and one of those actually is that you can morph into a different body. And that body doesn't even have to be the same gender as you currently are. It can be the body of of a different gendered person or of a no gendered person or of an animal or whatever. And mm. that shape shifting in fantasy is extremely common. Well, good to know. I'm not <laughs> the only one doing this. <laughs> you are not a weirdo. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that's kind of the point of having this conversation today too, is because a lot of people feel like, oh, these fantasies are bad and they're taboo and these aren't the things that are regularly talked about in sex education or even seen in in porn or in erotica or at sex parties it's it's very strange how how we treat fantasies because they are nearly universal so according to there's a study by Leitenberg Henning and no So there's a study by Leitenberg H. and Henning K., written in 1995, and they wrote in the Psychological Bulletin that sexual fantasies are nearly universal and have been reported in many societies across the globe. And despite the fact that they are nearly universal and that everyone actually has them, we don't talk about them and we're ashamed of them a lot of the time. I mean, if somebody asks you, what's your sexual fantasy, people... I mean, if anyone gives you an answer at all, it'll probably be like something like, oh my God, I'm like, I fantasize about chocolate cake, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Because for some reason, no one's going to like look you dead in the eye and be like, actually a gangbang with like 30 different guys and, you know, me in the middle, right? Like, mm-hmm. even if that is what they fantasize about, because for some reason we're like, oh my gosh, I can't say that. I can't tell this person that I have that fancy. They will judge me. They will think I am weird they'll think I'm disgusting and depraved and they will kick me out of you know normal society and friendship and no one will want to hang out with me again for some reason telling people our fantasies is such a vulnerable and emotionally charged thing that we don't often even do it even to our own partners Mm -hmm. which is crazy like we often don't even tell the person we're sharing a bed with what we fantasize about because we're so embarrassed of feeling like a weirdo. Mm-hmm. Like, do you remember the first time you told your partner your fantasies, Tara? Mm, not really, but I do know that with most lovers that I've had over the course of my life, I've always had this conversation I've always initiated it because I'm very curious and I want to know what they're interested in and a lot of times because they've never had that question before they would be like I don't really have a fantasy and so my next question is like well what kind of porn do you watch because a lot of times that could be kind of a gateway into having the conversation of what sort of fantasy you have and I'm very open when it comes to exploring sexually. So I wanted to try some of the things that they might have a fantasy about. But a lot of times I'd find the men, especially that I was with, were very reluctant to share and didn't even know how to really share. Even though I was giving them that space and opening up that conversation, they were still very closed off and probably my current partner were very open about everything. So I think we know pretty much what each other's fantasies are and we know which ones are ones that are just fantasies and which ones we want to maybe go and try and explore and do together. But 
that's like that's almost 10 years of a partnership and being together yeah it's I, I'll admit like it's still really hard for me to talk to my partner about fantasy I try and then for some reason something inside me is like and that's enough that's enough sharing <laughs> Because it is so socially ingrained that we don't talk about this stuff. And if we are going to talk about it, it's this constant scanning for does the other person like this fancy? Are they turned on by this fancy? They're not turned on by it. I'm just not going to say any more about it. They're not into it. Okay, never mind. I shouldn't have done this. Uh, forget it. No, I, yeah, no, I'm good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And like that risk of, them seeing you differently like that's something that you're constantly thinking about of are they going to view me differently because of this yeah and often our fantasies are very different from how we project ourselves in the real world right. and so there is that risk that someone will look at you and think really that's what you fantasize about because of their projections of you that they wouldn't have imagined that that would have been your fantasy but fantasies are so unpredictable. And like I said, they're coded in childhood often, you know, when our eroticism is just starting out and things happen to us in moments where our bodies might feel aroused and certain things are actually happening in our environment, those things can get coded into our eroticism. And it happens entirely by accident. We don't know when it's going to happen. And all of a sudden we can be stuck with a fantasy or a thing that really turns us on for the rest of our lives that we're like oh shit like right. I I would not have chosen to fantasize about this if I had the choice but we don't have the choice exactly and that's that's why it shouldn't be embarrassing you didn't get to choose this mm -hmm. this chose you and you get to now either own it or push it into a little corner where it will just keep rearing its head every time because that's what happens with things that we put into our shadows right the things that we put into the shadows they come back and bite us in a big way if we continue to ignore them and I'm happy you brought that up because there was this one particular individual that that I was with sexually like a long time ago and he was really into golden showers and mm -hmm. urine and you know, one night we got talking about why, and it was because of childhood trauma, like things that happened to him when he was really, really young. And like now it's like almost an obsession and a huge fantasy of him to have people like urinating on him. And I mean, it's not uncommon. It's hot, by the way, like just to like, you know, de-shamify it and normalize it for, for people who are listening. It's hot for me to do, that's for sure. Right? <laughs> like, you know, as someone who dabbles in dominatrix work, I have to say that I, I love the people who want golden showers. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that's great. And there there's a power thing at play here, but it doesn't have to be, right? So it could be that that person's core desire was to feel a power differentiation and to have that feeling of I am nothing and somebody can urinate on me because I'm worthless, right? That's a that's a legitimate core desire to feel worthless, which is also something that people don't talk about because you know when often when you ask people about their core desires, there's this list of things that are safe for them to say. Oh, my core desire is to feel cherished. My core desire is to feel special. My core desire is to feel um, loved. Like wow, that's beautiful. And for some people, that is their core desire. Main character energy. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and that's lovely. Well, we, we all have main character energy in our fancies, <laughs> but some of us have slightly darker ones, right? Because, right. Um, you know, the, the, that's legit to want to feel loved and cherished and whatever in your fancy. It's just as legit to want to feel humiliated and used and worthless and nothing and degraded. Those are completely legitimate core desires to have and people don't like saying that when someone's like oh what's your core desire they don't want to say I want to feel completely used and humiliated and degraded that's when sex feels really good to me because then they are scared that people will look at them and be like what okay do you have self-esteem issues or something right and no they don't have self-esteem issues that's just how they like to play with eroticism in their mind because perhaps when their eroticism was evolving back when they were 
10, 11, 12, maybe at some point in their life, they were aroused. And also they were in that moment feeling humiliated or degraded, or they felt less than someone else. And so into their autism went, you know, it's like a big cauldron and it all went in there and it all got mixed up. And so now feelings of humiliation, degradation, and feeling worthless come up when they're feeling aroused. Or Mm -hmm. when when they feel those feelings, there's an element of arousal there. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that that's how they evolved sexually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, once you have those more shadow side core fantasies, sometimes it's scary because you don't know the intentions of the person you're telling this to. Like you want to make sure that this person's safe and they're not going to... uh, use that against you, I want to say, or put you in a position where you are in an unsafe environment or they're not holding that space or that container. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's why like hiring a dominatrix to explore that is is a better option than just finding somebody on FetLife and going with them that night and let's explore this fantasy if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, if and that's even if you want to act your fantasies out. A lot of people don't want to act them out. And, you know, again, just getting back to the golden shower example, you know, having having a power differentiation is just one aspect of what that could be about. It could be that for that person, that's not their core desire. And that's not why they like golden showers. It could be that that person likes golden showers because they really like the feeling of warmth hitting their body in that particular way. Maybe one day as a kid, they were out in a rainstorm in somewhere warm, somewhere tropical. And, you know, they were feeling aroused and, you know, the heavens opened and (laughs) warm water was hitting their body in a certain way. And they were like, wow, this feels totally arousing. And now the feeling of getting urinated on feels like that to their body. And that feels hot to them. So we can't assume someone's core desire from knowing what their what their fantasy is. What we can do though, is use it as a place to ask more questions. So for example, if you if you do know that your partner likes golden showers or they've admitted that to you, you could say, tell me about why that's hot to you. Tell me about what it is about that, that that's hot to you. Is it the sensation? Is it the feeling of the psychological feeling behind it? Mm -hmm. What is it? So always inquire a little bit. If somebody asks you or tells you about their fantasy, see if you can ask them more questions around it. Because I think a lot of the times when we are trying to be safe people and hold space for people, people will tell us a fantasy and we can just, you know, sort of nod along and say, oh, yes, that's that's very hot. That's interesting. But if we don't ask any questions, they can also feel like we might be silently judging them. Right. Curiosity curiosity is really a way to make people feel seen and heard and de-shamified. And it's also a really great, great way for you to know what is underneath that fantasy for them. And especially if you're planning on playing with them, you would want to know what it is that's underneath that fantasy so that you can play with that dynamic more. Mm -hmm. No, that's great points. Being really curious, asking questions and you know, in the same breath too, if if that is a fantasy that they do want to act out and maybe if it's something that you're not comfortable with, like you're like, I'm not comfortable with urinating on you, then that can also be a gateway into finding other ways that maybe this can be creatively, um, a scene could be creatively put together and it doesn't have to go against what your body is telling you is a no. Correct. And that's the thing as well. People, you know, people t- underestimate their imagination so much because, you know, fantasy comes from the imagination. But let's say in that example, again, of somebody telling you that they like golden showers, they like being urinated on. And they say to you, would you do that for me? And your body is a hard no. Your body is like, I would absolutely never urinate on someone. Like, I don't even think I could. I would get pee shy. I, that sounds like something I just don't want to do. Pee shy is a thing. (laughs) Pee shy is a thing for sure. 
right? Like I can't even pee when there's someone in the toilet cubicle next to me in a public space. Like I wait for them to flush and leave. <laughs> I'm like, what do you think I'm doing in there? Of course I'm trying to pee, but like, it's like trying to pee really quietly. I don't know why I have that. I just have that. Anyway, that's besides the point. But in that situation, if you, if, if you really want to do something for your partner, but you don't think you could bring yourself to pee on them, okay, how about you fill up a squirt bottle with warm water, right? And you blindfold mm-hmm. them and you put them in the bath and you say, I'm going to pee on you. And then you squirt warm water on them from the bottle and you tell them, yeah, you like that? I'm peeing on you. How's that feel? Feel mm-hmm. good, right? You don't actually have to do the thing. You can create creatively move around the thing, still give them the feeling that they want to feel while still holding your boundaries. You do not have to cross your boundaries just because somebody else wants a fantasy. But if you really want to give them the feeling that they're looking for from fantasy, get creative because you can absolutely do it. Yeah. Like another example is if somebody wants to experience being with more than one partner and you're in a monogamous relationship and you're not really okay with that. All right, well, here, let's use this butt plug and also my penis. And that can really easily replicate feelings of being with somebody else. That's a huge hot, hot turn on for me if there's not another person available. And so I can say by experience that it does check some boxes. Absolutely. And that's a safe way of exploring orgy situations as well, because maybe you do fantasize about orgy situations and maybe you're not sure whether you'd ever want to do that in real life. There's a possibility that you might, but there's also like at this moment in time, you could say, no, it's a no, because I just don't feel safe doing that. Right. But then, like you said, you could absolutely put yourself in a situation where it could feel like you were in an orgy. Maybe you even put on background noise of like other people, right? Mm-hmm. So that you could like imagine that there's other people in the room. Maybe you get your partner to talk in different voices, mm-hmm. right? Because we can absolutely do that. And if you're blindfolded and you're hearing different sounds, you can absolutely be transported into a place emotionally and physically where you could imagine that this is actually happening and then tune into what that feels like in your body. How does it feel when my brain actually believes that this might be happening, do I still like it or do I not like it anymore? And that's a really safe way to experiment with a fantasy in a situation where you can actually say, no, stop, I don't like this. I can feel myself getting turned on a little bit talking about this. So we're going to pause. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about, well, fantasies, desires, and maybe a bit more about what this is like for your intimate relationships. Welcome back. Oh, we were just having a little chat off air. And yeah, we have we still have lots that we want to share with everybody. So we're just going to get into it. And I think one thing that I wanted to know because, you know, Sylvie gets sciency is can fantasies change over the course of a lifetime? They can and they can't is the answer to that one. Ooh, so conflicting. It is. Like like everything in sexuality, there is so much conflicting stuff. Right. But so again, going back to Jack Morin and his erotic mind, Jack Morin talks again about how these things are hardwired and blueprinted into us at a young age, and also how we then act out these patterns over and over again. These patterns, obviously, we we know that from neuroscience, that when you have a pattern and you continue doing it over and over again, you're myelinating those neural pathways. That means that you're building them up. It's kind of like if you have um, you know, a bicycle and you're driving it the same way every single day and you're creating a path, right? And every day that path is getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And then someone's like, oh, this is a bicycle path, right? That's what we're doing when we're myelinating our brains, basically the the neurons in our brains. And so when we're acting out the same fantasies over and over again, we're actually giving them more power in our imagination. 
So from that perspective, yes, there's a very strong likelihood that the fantasies that you have had, even as a child, will somewhat stick with you for the rest of your life in some way. Again, if they're problematic fantasies, and if you've worked on them, and if you have sort of acted them out in a consensual way and gotten to a point where you feel like you've resolved them, they might not hold quite as much power over you anymore, or okay. they might, right? And and stuff like that. But that's, that's only if you've kind of mm-hmm. wanted to get rid of them and you've done a lot of work on yourself in order to get to a point where those don't hold as much charge to you anymore, then they might feel less charged, right? But again, it's changing patterns is so hard. And we know it even just from regular things like, you know, going to the gym, right? Like building that pattern takes a while. Learning how to eat different kinds of foods, it takes a while. And there's still going to be, even if you have eaten healthy for the last 20 years, but as a kid, you really liked uh, cheeseburgers, like cheeseburgers <laughs> was just like your thing. Like, even if you've eaten healthy for 20 years, there is going to come a point of weakness where you're like, I just want a cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. And it's probably the same with our fantasies. Yes, they can change and evolve. And they do change and evolve based on, you know, the composites of things that are happening to us in our lives, different fantasies, different peak experiences, things that have happened with a partner that hadn't happened before that were extremely exciting and erotic, those things can be added into that cauldron. But that cauldron still has a base of core desires that were created when you were very little, and those will never truly go away. Hmm. Interesting. I, I could see that. I feel like mine have always kind of been like the same, but then as other sexual experiences has happened, Things have definitely changed as sexual experiences have happened to me. It's kind of like adding stuff in, right? Yeah, or subtracting. Interesting. Like, oh, I really didn't like that when I really tried it out. So I no longer see that as a fantasy for me or that was really hot to me. Like, I never really had fantasies of being with a woman when I was younger. But then when it happened, then that became a major part of my fantasies. Amazing. And that's and that's how fantasies can change over the course of a lifetime, right? Like when we try something and we like it, we add it to the repertoire. <laughs> if we try something and it's You're disgusting, <laughs> we take it out. Check. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, so how would you like coach somebody if they're like, I have this fantasy and I want to talk to my partner about this and you know, just, just share it. It doesn't mean that I want to act it out, but I want to like communicate it to my partner. What would be some of your suggestions of how they would approach that? It's interesting because I would love to have a client who was that forthright about their fancies, who was actually like, I have a fancy. I want to talk about it. I don't know how to talk about it. (laughs) In most cases, I do not get clients like that. In most cases, asking them about their fancies is a little bit like pulling teeth. Do you Mm -hmm. have fantasies? Eh, No, I mean, eh, not really. Really? You don't have any fantasies? You know, yes. Okay, fine. I do. What are they about? You know, normal things. What's normal to you? You know, like, I I don't, I don't know. And it's like, do you fantasize about gangbangs? And then they go r- bright red. And then they're like, how, how did you, how did you know that? And it's like, okay, it's a very common fantasy, right? So oftentimes people are not coming to to me as a somatic sex educator and telling me their fantasies. We actually have a really cool tool in somatic sex education that we use called the desire interview. I believe Mm -hmm. that it was um, Captain Snowden who invented the desire interview. I may be wrong, but I I believe that's that it was them that, that came up with it. But the desire interview is actually a really cool thing to do to your partner, to clients, if you're a coach, where again, we're leading with curiosity and no judgment. So we're setting up that space of, you know, no matter what your fantasy is, no matter what it is, you will not be judged for it in this space. We're not talking about people acting out their fantasies, not telling you things that they have done and you're not judging them. They're telling you things that are in their imagination. And Mm -hmm. we don't judge people for what's happening in their imagination. You can literally imagine anything you want And it is not illegal as long as you are not doing it and doing harm. 
So mm-hmm. again, we just set the space and say, there is zero judgment, no matter what you tell me is your fantasy. And then they start telling you and you ask them questions and you ask them questions in a way that is interested and engaged in their fantasy. So if somebody's saying, I actually, I have a fantasy that, I don't know, I, uh, I'm i driving my car to the car wash and the car wash attendant is super hot and, you know, at the car wash, I tell him to get into my car. And then while we're in the car wash, we just have like crazy steamy sex. You don't go, oh my God, really? Like with a total stranger? <laughs> no way, right? Like, no. What you say is, hmm, tell me about this car wash attendant. Like, what was he wearing? Mm-hmm. Or what color was the car in your fantasy? Does that matter? Right. Or yeah. were there tons of soap and bubbles? Or tell me about the car wash itself. Like, and how long did this car wash last? Like, was it a, like a really long car wash? Or like, was it really quick? And that was Quick exciting. wash. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, was it something about like, the cleaning of the car while inside you were being dirty is that like so be really curious about yeah. that person's fantasies because if you're if you're doing that interview and you know you're the journalist in this interview and you are asking all like think of any question you could possibly ask in a positive and engaging way they will open up and they'll tell you more and more details and the more details you have the more you have to work with yeah that's one of my favorite things to do, especially with couples, the desire, the desire interview. <laughs> how, how does that go for you when you, when you do that initially? Tell me about that with your clients. Well, I mean, it's not something that I throw in on the first session. This takes, you know, a few sessions before kind of getting into and just creating that space of choice and voice as well. And usually doing the fantasy doorway meditation that you offered at the beginning of this this episode. And then, you know, usually I'll get them to journal. So they start like thinking of like their top, I suggest doing 10 fantasies. I can't even come up with 10 in my head off, you know, it, it would take some sitting down and really thinking. And then just choosing one that they interview for each other. And so whatever feels safest, it might not be their top fantasy, but it's one from the list. And that's a starting point. And then doing it together, they're just like, this is really fun. And it does open up a lot of different avenues of things that you can explore sexually. You might not have that fantasy happen, but maybe parts of it, maybe that car wash fantasy with the attendant was hot because of just the smell of of the bubbles and the soap that's used. I mean, I can distinctively, that's the thing that came to my head. Like it's not really a turn on, but that's what came to my brain was the smell of it. And you're such a sensual person, Tara. <laughs> it's your <laughs> sensuality. You like give Tara any fantasy and she'll find the sensual aspects of that <laughs> fantasy because that's what she's coded for. And that's amazing. Yeah. It was the smell. So maybe like having sex in a freshly cleaned house. Like that's what would come to my head. And so it, it it creates different ways to get creative sexually. And it might not be that particular fantasy, but it gives you little brainstorm, brainstorm bubbles. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The, um, like the word maps and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my dog's Where one happy. thing leads to another, to another, to another. Yeah. So it's, it's a great starting point for couples to do. And, you know, I recommend sitting down and like taking notes and having this available for that one of those special nights where you might have a hotel room or you're on holiday. And sometimes you get a little bit overwhelmed, like your nervous system might be overwhelmed by going on a trip or, oh, we need to think of something sexy to do tonight. It's date night. And so it's just nice to go back to your sexy journal. That's what I call it. And be like, hey, like we cleaned the house or this hotel room's really clean and we can smell how clean it is. Like, let's play into this fantasy a little bit. Yeah. I love how everything is about cleanliness for you, Tara. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm not inviting you to my house until I've thoroughly cleaned it. Oh, mine's, mine's a disaster right now. <laughs> I have four animals, so you don't even want to know how much fur I find sometimes. it's And for some people, fur is a turn-on, you know? Oh, not me. 
not me at all. I I find it in my bed. It's just, ugh. but I do feel more sexual when I'm in a clean environment. Yeah. And that makes sense. It gets me out. If I'm like, oh my God, there's a pile of clothes there. Or <clears throat> I got fur in my mouth when I'm like making out with somebody like that just gets me out of the mood so quickly. So typically I feel more turned on and open to sexual experiences when I'm in a cleaner environment. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> another thing that's like really important when we're talking about fancy with other people. And again, we've we've said it in a variety of different ways, but just to make it clear again, don't yuck anybody's yum, right? Like everybody is going to have different things in fancy that they think is hot. And if we are saying, ew, that's gross, we're shutting them down, mm-hmm. right? Like even if you do think, ew, that's gross, maybe think of a way that you don't have to make it about you and how you think that's gross. You could say, wow, I can see that that's so hot for you, right? Right. Like where again, you're not making it about you and I would never, oh my God, I would never. Which is what I just said about fur. (laughs) You you said something interesting about fur. You were like, when I'm making out with someone and I get fur in my mouth and I was like, who is Tara making out with? (laughs) No, just fur from the house. Like, I mean, no judgment, no judgment. (laughs) There's fur in everything in my house. It's ridiculous. And that is not a turn on for me. If that's a turn on for somebody, they should definitely camp out in my house. They would, they wouldn't know what to do with themselves sexually. They would love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> would be like furry paradise. Basically, I should just like, I should figure out how I can list my house as an Airbnb for for that specifically fantasy. It's like when <laughs> I was in when I was traveling in Japan, they have these sex rooms that you can rent. So they have these places that you can rent by the hour in in these buildings. You go in, you pay for an hour or, you know, however many hours of time you want. And they have these different themed rooms that work for people's different fantasies. So some of the rooms could look like a subway car, right? So you could like pretend to be on a subway and, you know, your partner could be groping you in the subway car and maybe that's like a turn on for you in one of your fantasies. Or maybe you'd be in like a jungle room where there's like noises of, you know, lions roaring and birds tweeting and leaves rustling and maybe that's a turn on for you. Or maybe being under the ocean is a turn on and you want to imagine like a giant squid penetrating you or something. I don't know. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> but you can literally choose the room that goes with your fantasy so that if you are more visually stimulated, like literally every time you open your eyes, you're confronted with, okay, I am actually like under the sea or whatever. Amazing. Or in outer space or whatever that fantasy is, which is super cool. I feel like I I saw this on a television show quite a while ago though, not recently, before Netflix. I feel like it was this documentary of this guy and he would go places. His name was Ashley. And he was from the UK, I believe. And he traveled around to all these different places where there was erotic taboo things happening. I'm pretty sure he did a tour of this hotel. Cool. Well, it was fun. So if you ever find yourself in Japan, feel free to do that. Or, you know, there's also that other show on Netflix, which is, you know, how to build a sex room. Right. right? And again, you don't have to hire an um, incredible designer to like, redesign your house to make it all sexy and aligned with your fantasies but you can actually buy things for your room or or whatever room you're having sex in that you can you know set your room up in a certain way before you have sex that will make it more conducive to your fantasy if you're really into latex maybe you really you know maybe you love latex so you want to have a few latex outfits maybe you want to put latex sheets on the bed Maybe you want to clear away any clutter and dim the lights and have a space that looks a little bit more dungeony, right? Then maybe you are creating your own fantasy in your own space and setting it up in a way that just really works for your senses because your senses are really important. You know, to Tara, it's the feeling of, of cleanliness and and that matters. To me, sounds really matter. So if there are distracting sounds in my environment or sounds that don't conduce to my fantasy, I am so turned off so fast. So 
I desperately need sounds to be aligned with what is going on in my fantasy. And if it's not aligned, that is not good news for whoever I'm with. Interesting. Yeah. I totally need a sex room and no animals allowed and a shower. That that sounds really (laughs) nice. Yeah. It's space for us. Honestly, we've talked, we watched that Netflix show and we were like, we need this. Like this is because our room is overtaken and it's not super sexy all of the time. And having a space just for you to explore sexually, it just seems really hot and inviting. Yeah. So tell me, Tara, do you think there are situations where you should or should not act out your fantasies? Well, you know me, I'm kind of the consent person. So uh, if consent isn't being used, then I think that's one of the times that maybe you shouldn't be acting out your fantasies and having like if you're with another person, ensuring that you've communicated that this is a fantasy that you would like to explore and you would like access to their body in order to explore it. They have to say yes to that or say that they're willing to give that to you. Yeah. And sometimes access to someone's body doesn't even need to be them touching your body, right? Like if you have a partner who has a foot fetish, for example, or let's say you have a foot fetish, consent looks like asking your partner, can I look at your feet while I Mm self-pleasure? Or, you know, would you put your feet on me on my on my belly or on my leg or anywhere on my body doesn't necessarily have to even be on your genitals would you put your feet on me while you're touching me or while I'm touching myself right like that's consent as well and if the person is like no I feel like my feet are gross and I don't like them and that grosses me out and I don't want to like I don't want to do that that's a no Mm -hmm. and then you can get creative and see if there's other ways that you could you know, arouse your partner. Maybe you want to print out pictures of pretty feet and be like, here, you can look at these while we're, you know, while we're having sex. Maybe that, that'll be a good solution, right? If, if you don't like your own feet or the thought of feet in general is not arousing to you and you can't get past it. But again, knowing that there's that consent available and that you don't have to consent, that just because something turns your partner on or something turns you on, doesn't mean that you or your partner actually have to engage with that fantasy. They do get to say no to your fantasies. Mm -hmm. They do get to say no to even hearing about your fantasy, actually. Exactly. That's a really good point, Sylvie. And like, how how does somebody... (laughs) Rejection is a thing. (laughs) Yeah. How do do people navigate hearing either, no, I don't want to do that with you. I'm not interested. Or no, I don't even want to hear about your fantasy. That That's tough. Does happen. I mean, you have to learn how to deal with disappointment. Is you know because it's I have I have a five year old. He constantly wants to tell me about Minecraft, right? Like, and I do not consent to listening to him talk about Minecraft anymore. But <laughs> he gets incredibly disappointed when I don't want to hear about it. And right. I know that he's really excited about it. And I really wish that I cared enough about it that I could listen to him talk more about it. But I just don't. And it's driving me mad. And it can be the same with our partners and certain fantasies, especially if there's one that keeps coming up over and over again. And they're so insistent about it. And they really just want you to listen to it. You can draw that boundary and say, this is actually something that's turning me off now at this point, because I have said no, that I do not consent to listening anymore to this fantasy. Right. And your partner doesn't get to say, well, that's not fair. And if you loved me and whatever else in that situation, your partner has to say, well, that's very disappointing. And it's on me to deal with my disappointment. And there are tools for dealing with our disappointment. And sometimes then we get to like, go tell our sex coach or our therapist or a really close friend that that was a disappointing experience that our partner did not want to hear about that that fantasy, even though it's really important to us. And sometimes just having someone else say, oh, that really sucks. It sounds like you really, really wanted to communicate more about this fantasy and your partner didn't want to hear it. 
that must have really felt rejecting. That must have really hurt. That must have felt really sad. And for that person to have their feelings about it, be like, yeah, it was frustrating. And it was so disappointing. And I'm so sad about it. That's great. Like you should totally have a person that you can offload those feelings to. And that person should not be your partner if they did not consent. Yeah, that was one suggestion that came to my head was having a somatic sex educator that you that you're able to go to. And maybe that's somebody who listens to first the situation that this happened and then also provides that space that you can share your fantasy and kind of explore what that means to you. Absolutely. But yeah, it is. It's not on your partner to deal with your issues that you have around rejection and to make you feel better. And that's part of doing the work. And doing the work is hard. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, we do the work. We like it's not like sex educators are immune from this either. We also mess up. We also have things that feel disappointing and we don't know how to get past them. Mm-hmm. It's normal. It's a normal part of human experience. And with fantasies in particular, because they feel so vulnerable and mm-hmm. because they are part of how we're coded, like they are part of us, like our DNA is part of us. It can feel really rejecting when someone doesn't want to hear them or engage in them. It can feel like, wow, they're rejecting me. They're not rejecting you, but they cannot, for whatever reason, handle that particular fantasy or that share. And that doesn't, like, that's really hard work to decouple your fantasy from yourself, but it's really necessary to do it because you are not your fantasies. They are a part of you, But there's other parts of you and other reasons why your partner probably loves you. And they may jive with your fantasies and that's great. And they may not Mm -hmm. and get support if that's the case, but also realize that all is not lost because as sex educators, especially, we are very creative in finding ways to help you find, find ways that you can tell your partner what you want without turning them off. Mm-hmm. or triggering or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> exactly. So I think we're going to do a little pause before we go into the IG questions. We only have two, which is good because we're kind of, we're running into the last end, uh, the end of our, our show here. So we're going to pause, quick commercial break. And when we come back, IG questions. Welcome back. We are in the last segment of our show today. And Sylvie is going to ask me the IG questions. Yes. So these are questions that came in on our Instagram DMs. And again, just to remind everyone, if you want to ask a question that we answer on this show, feel free to DM us and we will try and answer them. So the first question that we got here today, Tara, was how does someone consider something taboo? Yeah. And I think that's a great question, but same breath. It's, it can be so different how something is defined as taboo from culture to culture, depending on your religion, depending on how you were brought up, depending on what you actually talked about in your youth when it came to sex and sexuality. And I feel like taboo can just mean something that isn't the norm for you. So whereas I don't think it's taboo for bisexuality or to be gay, some people might consider that to be really taboo because of the way that they were brought up or the religion that they believe in. So, I mean, you can't just have like, here's the line of what is taboo and here's the line of what isn't. You know, in the 70s, it was what anal sex was considered really taboo. And lots of people engage in anal sex today and way less people consider that taboo. And it kind of changes from generation to generation as conversations about sex and sexuality and relationships evolve. Is there anything you want to add? 
I was going to say, I think that's a, a really good definition of it. And also to remember as well that taboo isn't just a generational thing. It's a social context thing. Different countries have different things that are taboo. Mm-hmm. Right? For example, in America, showing your boobs is really taboo. Like you go to any beach in America and people are not topless sunbathing. You go to any beach in the south of France or, you know, Italy and you're going to look like a real weirdo if, you, if you're not topless sunbathing. People are going to be like, wow, you're going to get tan lines. Why would you do that? You're so right? taboo. <laughs> right? You're so taboo. Why are you doing that? But it's different cultures and different age groups and different whatever groups have different things that are considered taboo. So, yeah. you know, just bearing in mind that what, what someone considers taboo might be totally acceptable for someone else. And what is totally acceptable for someone else might be really off limits. So not necessarily having a list of things that you know are taboo. They might just be taboo because that's the culture and country and religion you were raised in. Yeah, exactly. I think there isn't one way to define it. So what is the second question? Second question is, I'd love more information on pegging and rimming. Most people consider that taboo. Tara. What what do you have to say about pegging and rimming and both of those things being considered taboo? Yeah, definitely for some people, they are considered taboo. And for some people, it's considered a part of what they engage in sexually every time they're with somebody. So again, different people, different cultures, different upbringings, it's all going to be considered taboo or not considered taboo. And as somebody who often will indulge in pegging it can also be really hot and it is a pretty big sexual fantasy for a lot of males i find and a lot of times they're really afraid of bringing that up because it demasculates them and um, might associate them with being gay and so they that's a fantasy that they might not ever talk about But there is actually my friend, Cooper S. Beckett, he just released a book called The Pegging Book, which I'm looking at right now. If you go to his website, coopersbeckett.com, it's a complete guide to anal sex with a strap-on dildo. And he goes into lots of great questions about being a straight guy and enjoying pegging and how it feels and talks about safety, male anatomy, health benefits of being pegs. So I definitely encourage people to go and check out this book. I believe you can buy it on Amazon and the tool shed is what it says here. So, and he did a lot of research and put a lot of effort into this book. So it's a really great resource if you're looking for more information. That sounds amazing. And again, as sex educators, just to remind people, you know, like pegging and rimming, they're both incredibly hot fantasies. If you're going to do them in real life, you know, you might want to check into what are some of the health and safety things that you can do to have like a more pleasurable experience during pegging and rimming. And again, you know, there are some people that, you know, anything to do with the anus is going to be taboo because we have this idea of cleanliness, right? When it comes to the anus. And first of all, we were not going to unpick cleanliness and whether whether that is accurate or not accurate but you know for people for whom that is a concern you know there are definitely ways to clean your anus before engaging in activities that can reduce that ick factor for people if that is a concern for them and Mm -hmm. if that is what is creating the resistance then again reach out to your local sex educator find out ways in which pegging and rimming can be made more safe and more palatable to you, palatable (laughs) and pleasurable for you, you know, and, and, and really dig into, you know, if you have a resistance, what is that resistance and explore that because sometimes we can turn our resistances into our biggest turn-ons and pleasure just by making a few simple adjustments. So just saying. No, that's a great point. And yeah, douching is nothing to be ashamed of. And most of the people I've been with who I've used a strap on with definitely feel more comfortable doing that. And 
experience more pleasure because they're not worried about the what ifs. So, but yeah, I think that that kind of wraps up our show for today. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of our amazing listeners for tuning into today's episode. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access info, we invite you to get social with us. The show's Instagram is the.sexed.show and our individual Instagrams is sex ed for the modern bed and sex and sensibility with the E in sex being a three. So you can go look us up on there and all of our information for our websites is also in the show description. So until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body and stay in presence.